We've all wondered what it'd be like up in space, looking down at our pale blue dot. But would any of us have even the first idea how to survive as an astronaut? Jumping forward to the not-so-distant future, join me now on an unforgettable adventure that'll put everything you think you know about space to the test. With you in the spaceship captain's seat, it's time for liftoff. Amazing. Diverting Doom as winner of the Earth's Finest Space Captain Award for 2099, you've been assigned to deal with a 10-mile-wide asteroid that's headed straight for our planet. Alongside your crew, you'll need to choose the best course of action. Do you A, launch a nuclear bomb at the asteroid, blowing it to pieces, and get as far away as possible? B, spray the asteroid in a nice white paint, so at least it looks cool if it hits Earth? Or C, attempt to nudge it off course with your ship? Nudging even a small asteroid with your ship would be a very risky endeavor, even if your ship was designed for that purpose. But pushing a 10 mile wide asteroid off course in this way would require an extreme amount of energy, not to mention the damage it'd do to your ship. As for the explosive option, the blast would only make more, smaller, but still lethal chunks headed for Earth. After all, even asteroids around 35 meters across can pose a threat to a town or city. The paint job, on the other hand, would trigger something known as the Yarkovsky effect. By using a bright color that reflects light, less of the sun's energy would be absorbed by the asteroid. This energy would instead be reflected in a high enough quantity to produce a force and actually change the asteroid's path. This is a real method that our world's finest scientists have proposed to deal with rogue asteroids. Space Pirates as you venture out further into the solar system, you're suddenly attacked by space pirates. Before long, they're racing alongside you less than 100 feet away. They're preparing their weapons for an attack, so you'll need to act fast before they blow you to cosmic smithereens. Do you A, shoot them with the powerful sideward blaster on the front end of your ship? B, use your weaker sideward blasters on both the front and rear of your ship? Or C, hit them with your nuclear bomb? Firing a nuclear bomb at a target less than 100 feet away is suicide. After all, the explosion would be unrestricted by the air we have on Earth, sending deadly shrapnel, radiation, and heat in all directions. Your front-only blasters, on the other hand, will generate a significant amount of unbalanced force on your ship's front end. This will send you spinning out of control. Shooting the front and rear blasters at the same time means the forces upon your ship are equal. You'll just be pushed slightly further away while retaining your forward momentum and ensuring an accurate shot. Sayonara, space pirates. Cut loose. After your space battle, your ship needs some minor repairs. You head out in your spacesuit and start fixing a damaged oxygen tank on the ship's side. Suddenly, the tank explodes, sending you flying outward with enough force to sever your support line. While the snap slowed your movement down to a walking pace, it disabled your suit's propulsion system, and now you're slowly floating away into the abyss. Spacesuits take 45 minutes to put on, so no one will be able to rescue you for at least that long. How do you get back into the airlock? A, wait for help, remaining still and calm. B, move your legs and arms in a swimming motion. Or C, take off your spacesuit shoe and throw it away from you, breaching your spacesuit in the process. In space, doing nothing for 45 minutes could leave you hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from your ship, bringing your chances of rescue close to zero. Trying to swim would be useless as there's no medium to push against in the vacuum of space. You need to throw something to change your momentum. The shoe from a spacesuit would be heavy enough to change the direction of your walking pace flotation, and a well-aimed throw would have you floating back to the spaceship. That's not to say it'll be a pleasant journey though. Space to breathe. Although you're floating back to safety, removing your shoe has breached your spacesuit. With the air rushing almost instantly out of your suit, do you A, breathe out as far as you can, B, take a deep breath and hold it, or C, hold some breath in your lungs, but not too much.
While countless space films would have you believe you'd freeze up or explode in space's vacuum, this is inaccurate. Depending on whether you were in shade or direct sunlight, your foot might experience some freezing or burning, but nothing deadly. The danger is that the vacuum of space will try its best to pull the air out of your body by any means. This can rupture your blood vessels or worse if you don't help the air leave your body as soon as possible. So your best bet is unquestionably to force it out before space does the forcing for you. Pit Stop After surviving your traumatic near-death experience, you continue your exploration mission, ending up near Jupiter. Unfortunately, more serious issues arise with your ship and you need to park it up somewhere so you can get out in your suit and fix it. In your area of the solar system, there are three choices. A, the surface of Jupiter, B, the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa, or C, the surface of a passing asteroid that's traveling at 67,000 miles per hour. Firstly, even if you were able to make it through the chaotic layers of gas that account for much of Jupiter's bulk, its solid core would be no place to stop. With temperatures as high as 64,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not exactly an ideal garage spot. Europa isn't a great spot for a hurried outside repair job either, as its surface is constantly bombarded by lethal radiation emitted by Jupiter. Even your spacesuit couldn't protect you from that. Which leaves the asteroid. While 67,000 miles per hour may seem fast, it's the same speed Earth travels relative to the sun. After all, all speed is relative. With a little acceleration, the asteroid would be relatively easy for your ship to land on and would soon be free of the worst of Jupiter's radiation. Staying grounded. You're all parked up on the two mile wide space rock. Pushing off the ship down to the asteroid surface, you're unexpectedly hurled 30 feet forward in the minimal gravity. As you balance yourself, you realize you've picked up an almost empty oxygen tank and it just ran out. You really need to work on your organization skills. That is, if you make it back to the ship, of course. How do you get back? A. Crawl slowly back to the ship, hoping you don't pass out from lack of oxygen. B. Wait for your crew to suit up and retrieve you. Or C. Utilize the low gravity to jump back to the ship, pushing off the ground as hard as possible. Remember what I mentioned earlier about it taking 45 minutes to put a spacesuit on? Well, going without oxygen for that amount of time, there's almost no chance you'd survive. As for the low gravity jump, bad idea. The gravity on asteroids can be so weak that moving around without floating off into space is a real challenge. You've experienced the lack of gravity already, leaving your ship, so jumping high would likely mean floating away to your slow, lonely death. The only option is to stay low and pull yourself carefully along. The minimal remaining oxygen in your blood should last, seeing as your life depends on it. Below the Belt Back on the ship, with repairs completed, you decide to begin your return to Earth. But disaster strikes again. You realize there's not enough food to last your crew all the way back to Earth. You only have enough to get to Mars, where luckily you know of a few human bases. But getting to Mars means passing through the asteroid belt between Jupiter and the Red Planet. If you take it slow, you can be more careful, but it'll mean your journey will include three weeks without food. Which is the best option? A, take it slow, risking fatal starvation for both yourself and your crew. B, select one crew member who will be forced to give up their food for everyone else. Or C, race as quickly as possible through the asteroid belt without risk of starvation. Firstly, essentially sacrificing a crew member is going to turn at least one of them against you which could lead to mayhem. That's the last thing you need. Slowness and starvation may seem wise, but is in fact unnecessary. The asteroid belt seems daunting, but the actual number of sizable asteroids within the unimaginably huge distances of the area is negligible, and so are your chances of hitting one. NASA sends probes through there all the time, as collisions are incredibly unlikely. So make haste. Welcome to Mars. You make it to Mars, but your ship malfunctions during landing and you crash to the ground. You're the only survivor, 
but you manage to find your way to a nearby base. The sturdy doors to the pressurization chamber open, revealing a woman in a dress who greets you with a smile. Once the doors close and you're repressurized, you enter the base. Only something seems amiss with the people. Eventually, the base's overseer tells you one of the inhabitants has been replaced by an alien imposter. Can you work out who it is? A, a man who insists on covering his face with bandages, claiming he's been burnt by exposure on Mars' surface. B, the woman who let you in. Or C, the man with each eye a different color. It's possible for a human to have different colored eyes. Just look at the original space oddity himself, David Bowie. The condition is called heterochromia iridis. As for the bandage man, your suspicion as to why he wants to remain covered is understandable. But all other possibilities are eliminated when you consider that the woman, wearing nothing but a dress, exposed herself to the raw surface elements of Mars when she let you in. Clearly, she's able to survive on the surface world of Mars unscathed, and that is something we humans sadly cannot do. Take it home. The imposter reveals that she's actually a Martian, part of an ancient underground civilization on the Red Planet. While originally sent to the surface to spy on humans, she's grown fond of them and wants to help you get home. She says she'll allow you to use her personal spaceship if you can solve her one riddle. For this, you'll have to use all your cunning and figure the answer out for yourself. I am found where every end begins, as well as the end of time and space. I am essential to creation and I surround every place. What am I? I hope you guessed it or you'll be making Mars your new home. So what starts every end, comes at the end of time and space, is a part of creation and surrounds every place. Simple, the letter E. And speaking of that letter, Earth, here we come. Lonesome Road. Traveling back to Earth on the Martian ship, weeks and weeks of loneliness and boredom begin to drive you crazy. One day you notice there's a cryo chamber that the Martian has previously used to freeze herself on long journeys. What should you do? A, nothing, wait out the 300 day journey, even if it takes a toll on your sanity. B, program the cryo chamber for 300 days and climb in to pass the time. Or C, try the cryo chamber for a single week, so if anything goes wrong with the ship, you're more than likely to wake up in time to fix it. As much as cryo sleep seems appealing, there's one small problem. Humans simply can't be frozen in this way. It's a sci-fi myth. In reality, our cells and bodies are too delicate to withstand freezing of this kind, even for a week. As she already demonstrated, the Martian is able to withstand much harsher conditions, so we can't compare our body's capabilities to hers. And so, without another choice, favoring madness over death, we wait. It's going to be a long ride. Did you make it to the end of this crazy space-bound adventure? And how many of these space riddles did you get correct? Let me know in the comments section below and see how you measured against other space riddlers. Thanks for watching.